Uh, I am going to provide a brief, and I, and I really hope to remain brief introduction to our speakers tonight, who in a way don't really need an introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, but I'd like to tease out the connections and answer one of the questions that somebody posed to me, sort of why Drew Faust and Sally Mann. Um, Sally Mann is one of America's most renowned photographers. She was born and raised in Lexington, Virginia, where she continues to live and work to this day. Oh, I have a clicker, too. Um, so, um, Sally Mann began making photographs in the 1970s and rose to national prominence in 1992 with the publication of her book, Immediate Family, a trenchant and powerful exploration of both childhood and motherhood through the lens of her own three children. And in the years since, she's created a richly diverse, powerful, and often staggeringly beautiful body of work. The exhibition that you've seen upstairs, A Thousand Crossings, explores five series of work through the lens of man's deep, enduring, and ever-changing connection to the South. Mann has not only grappled with her Southern heritage in her work, but it also grounds her 2015 memoir, Hold Still. This book, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, distinction, I might add, she shares with Drew Faust, um, to be a finalist for that very esteemed prize, um, actually had its start a decade ago um, at Harvard when she was asked to deliver the Massey Lectures there. Speaking of Harvard, our other guest, Drew Gilpin Faust, also grew up in Virginia, in her case on a farm in Clark County in the Shenandoah Valley. Let's see if I can get that picture. Um, and after a childhood of raising animals and excelling in the 4-H club, there we go, um, <laughs> it's so cute. Um, she went north, though, I think a move that we'll hear about more tonight, to Concord Academy, and um, then enrolled in Bryn Mawr, where she graduated magna cum laude with honors in history, and soon after uh, achieved a master's and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where she rose to be the Walter Annenberg Professor of History, specializing in the history of the South in the antebellum and Civil War periods. And in 2001, she made the leap uh, to move to Boston to become dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study after it merged with Harvard. And a mere six years later, she was appointed the 28th president of Harvard University. She's not only the first woman to hold this role, but also the first individual in 335 years to do so without a Harvard degree. And perhaps more to the point for tonight's conversation, she is the first Southerner to have held this position. And it's this Southern heritage and the ways that has profoundly shaped her intellectual and personal trajectory that I hope will provide the fodder for tonight's conversation. I want to note just a few of the many groundbreaking um, books by Faust that have transformed our understanding of the South in the Civil War. Among them, Mothers of Invention, uh, Women of the Slaveholding South, in the American Civil War, and uh, the 2008 book, This Republic of Suffering, a work that explored how this country's understanding of death was utterly transformed by the devastation of the Civil War, and how that conflict created a new culture around death and dying. And this book, this was the finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, is also the work that brought Drew Faust and Sally Mann into the same orbit. For it was just about two years ago when Sarah Greeno and Sally and I sat and were discussing the catalog for A Thousand Crossings and assembling kind of our dream team of who we wanted to write for the catalog. And in particular, who might speak to Sally Mann's pictures of Civil War battlefields, a project in which she explores um, how death sculpted the landscape. And we knew that Drew Faust was the perfect person, and there was just one small hitch, which is that she was perhaps a little busy running an institution uh, down the street. Nevertheless, we persisted, and we asked her, <laughs> and much to our amazement and delight, and perhaps to your temporary chagrin, um, 
uh, Drew, you agreed to write for the catalog. And the essay that you wrote, The Earth Remembers, Landscape and History in the Work of Sally Mann, is not only a lucid and beautiful contribution to the exhibition and a reflection on the Civil War and the culture of death and dying, but also really uh, illuminated for us the myriad connections between the two of you and how in your careers um, and in your personal life and in the kind of moral conviction of your work, both you and uh, Sally, um, that this culture, this heritage of being a Southerner and this constant interrogation of what this means, this almost burden of the South has, has shaped your work. Um, but there's also many, many other uh, fascinating coincidences. And so I think I'm gonna really turn the program over to the two of you um, and ask about a little bit about this question of origins, maybe starting with the question of place. And here I'm gonna just put up one of Sally's photographs of Blue Hills near her home. And um, this photograph, which was made, you can tell us a little bit about the photograph. The photograph on the right is looking out my back door as a child. Um, it was actually a photograph taken originally with an 8x10 view camera, which was a passion my first husband had. And he traipsed all over the fields of the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley and of our farm, taking pictures of Virginia. So I found these striking resonances. Obviously, he was uh, not of the caliber of photographer of Sally Mann. That wasn't a professional commitment. It was a hobby. But nevertheless, this landscape and the air the, the air and kind of mood of the landscape is something that I looked at and thought a lot about all my life, and I, I found your photographs just so stunning and redolent with the reality of what it was to grow up in that landscape at and the moment age. we both did. Yeah. I'm a little bit older than Sally, but we're essentially the same era yeah. of, of growing up in yeah. the 1950s. Yeah, and, and truly shocking parallels. I thought you were going to list some of them. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to well, let us discover let me. them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Somebody's no. prepared. <laughs> no, this is just this uh, interview that you gave, which is fascinating. But I just kept circling things over and over again, the animal husbandry and the uh, your rebellious daughter and who clashed with your, her mother about clothes. Oh, man. At least I wore them. Yeah. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> but yeah, you turned into a proper lady at the end of it all. You think? Well, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, now you're free of Harvard. You can really bust loose. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we just wait. I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the similarities, the sent off to boarding school in the north, and uh, oh God, it I, just I, goes I on I have a on. question about that, actually. I mean, I'd like to go back to the childhood a little bit, and I'm, I'm interested also, if you're comfortable talking about your parents and, and the sort of, your mothers, right? And both yeah, 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 seem yeah, to have same. had kind of flamboyant fathers um, and somewhat more uh, withholding mothers. But I'm also interested in the fact that both of you, you know, grew up in the segregated South and uh, had differing, I think, levels of awareness of, of injustice, but at a critical time in this country's history, but also your own personal histories, you both went to school elsewhere. You, uh, you went to Concord when you were just going into ninth grade, I believe, right, an mm -hmm. all-girls school in Massachusetts. And then you went to Putney for high school as well. Mm -hmm. And so what were those experiences like? I'm, the all girls, I think, was really, I went to an all girls high school, so junior high and high school. Um, and it was really formative for me. And I'm curious about that. But also, when you returned to the South, did you have a different lens because of being away? Of course I did, but you were a whelp when you left. You were a tiny child. I, it was right before my 13th birthday when I, when I left. Were you glad to go? I was so relieved. Ah. And I th one of the aspects that, that I think is a, just a basis for understanding our lives, and add to it or correct if I get it wrong, 
But there was a society that was set in a series of expectations and norms about how people behaved and especially how white and black people were supposed to relate to one another. And we were taught these in very indirect ways for the most part so that we almost weren't aware of having been taught them. Right. And yet, in the mid-1950s with Brown v. Board and the other changes, all of this began to be questioned. And we heard it on the radio or we heard it from conversations around us. But I think we were both at that age, not fully aware of what it all meant. And for me, being picked up and moved to Massachusetts gave me a distance and a perception on that, and particularly a perception, as you suggested, Sarah, about what it was to be a girl and to be a smart girl. It was always a problem that I was a really good student and a girl. And what was to be you done with that me? Problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was to be done with me and where would I yeah. fit in? And somehow when I got to Massachusetts and to Concord, it was, this is a place where we welcome that, but it's also a place where you can get a little distance and a little perspective on this world you came from. And you talk about going to Putney and the year of Faulkner as you mm -hmm. read yourself yeah. into your own region in right. a way. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. But what's interesting, you at nine were aware of the inequity. And the, okay, what, what Sarah didn't tell you all is that she wrote a letter to President Eisenhower. We couldn't get Adlai Stevenson elected. Did your parents <laughs> work for Adlai Stevenson? Oh, well, my they, parents were really? Republicans. Oh, no, they were big Eisenhower. Oh, because my parents were ardent Stevenson. See, I think this is a big difference yep. between I'll us. Say. You had <laughs> you had progressive I parents. I had very progressive. I parents. did not. That's my parents were very know. conventional yeah. Southerners. Yeah, that's one views. thing I wanted to find out from you. We actually don't know each other at all, so we're just figuring all this out. So, so this woman at age nine writes a letter to President Eisenhower protesting the inequities in American society, which is astonishing. Nine. I, I wasn't thinking like that at nine, and I wasn't thinking like that until probably 16, until the year, as she put it, the year of Faulkner. Um, so uh, my question to you is that how did you, being raised in a conservative home that supported Dwight Eisenhower, how did you make that come to that? Did something happen? Did you see something that disturbed you? Was there one pivotal moment for you? Something penetrated my consciousness, and it must have been related to school integration questions in Virginia and the rise of massive resistance, which you've also written yeah. about when Harry Byrd, our senator, said... And her we'll, neighbor. And my neighbor, <laughs> yeah. We'll close the schools before we integrate them. And for me, this was, at age nine, a wake-up call because I thought, you mean there are no black people in my school for a studied purpose, not just by accident? And it suddenly struck me that there was this line of, of discrimination that I had not entirely understood. And I've wondered since then, Sally, why this mattered to me so much. And I do think it, it had something to do with being a girl in a family of brothers where they had privileges that I did not. Mm -hmm. And that was the basis for my fighting with my mother all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't do this. You have to wear a nice dress. You have to behave yourself. You have to sit nicely. You have to do all these girl things. And I was just always pissed off about it. So you trained you, this was and an so equity I think, writ large. I, yeah, so I think that made me open to a sense of, well, those people can't even go to my school? What, what kind of world is this? Yeah, so, but, but like you said, it was in the water. It was just understood that they didn't go yeah, to your school. Yeah. I mean, what made you, it's just odd that you questioned it, and at such a young age that you, but you mentioned church, so your family went to church, and in church they taught you all the churchy virtues. Right, so right. maybe you were and able those to were see in the hypocrisy yeah. within that somehow. Um, but I did. I, I don't know. I just didn't. I just assumed that that's the way it was, and I didn't ask the question. But when I got out of there into New England, then it really cast things into sharp relief for me in ways that that enabled me to begin to think about how do I deal with this. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what we've seen is this powerful parallel is the way our professional lives and commitments have been about grappling with that heritage in the very different, but, but some, in some ways similar ways we have. Yeah, I, th I, th I think so. You, but you were so much more, 
pro proactive, I hate that verb, um, or is it an adjective? I hate, the, hate them both. Um, <laughs> I mean, you immediately went to, you went to Selma and you were 16 years old. I know this because I have my notes here. <laughs> <laughs> you were 16 when you went to Selma. 17. 17. And you yeah. didn't even tell your parents. Yeah, you were bold, really. Now, I think of you as being bold. No, not at all. I was busy making out with my boyfriends in the dark room. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you got into photography? Yes, of course. When you, ah. <laughs> when you made that comment earlier today, you said I spent a lot of time in the dark room when I was young. I thought, yeah, I did too. <laughs> we weren't doing the same things. <laughs> yeah, you. I just don't understand what made you so um, active, reactive. Well, I wonder if some of it is that you did have progressive parents. So I was rebelling you, against them by being... Well, maybe you felt that you were actually... Uh, I mean, you talk about the sort of sense of helplessness, that there was, a, there was segregation, there was nothing you could do about it, and at the same time, you knew that your parents... Uh, they had good intentions, right? And it, it was more, perhaps less um, clear-cut in your household, where it sounds like you, know, you are a nine-year-old intersectional feminist, you know, sort of long before that was the term, in part because your parents were very conservative, you know, so there was perhaps more for, to rebel against, and you had this competition for, with your brothers or a sense of injustice within the I've family. I've always had a sense of injustice with my brothers, too, but it didn't manifest in the same yeah. way. I short-sheeted them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think it's just remarkable that you... Do you suppose it was you were rebelling maybe a little bit against your parents? Oh, this was sure. your form oh, I'm of sure. rebellion? I'm sure. And you know, another thing I've thought about, Sally, with we've kind of traced these various parallels in our lives, but you have stayed in the South and embraced the South and represented the South in its very complex ways. I had to get out of there. And so that's a very different outcome. I was speaking before the program at with a gentleman who I'm looking at right now who's from Richmond, and he talked about, he's about my age, he's a little younger than I am, and he said the young women he grew up with in Richmond had to get out of there to survive, and that's how I felt. I had to get out to take my, I had to go back to take my picture. That's, I had to go back to take mm -hmm. the pictures I wanted. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because yeah. I've always found these beautiful landscapes that we've seen both so captivating but so ironic in that they are so captivating and yet they were so hostile to me as a child. That place was so, I was so at odds with that place yeah. when I was a child. Yeah. But you were never at odds with the place somehow. It was you and the place against all comers yeah. or against yeah. whatever so my So you don't have this deep, profound affection for your ancestral acres, even if there's... I haven't been back there in 16, 17 Good. Yeah, okay, so no, that, that, that's a very, very different. And you went to a, it was all girls, Concord was all girls. Well, just as a quick detour, do you think there's a place for all girls education? <laughs> this is just, no, I'm just curious. I'm curious because there's an all girls school near where I live, and I'm, I'm just, what she said. Well, I'm the product of both Concord Academy and Bryn Mawr College. Yeah, and you really went to Hollands, Hollands, right? That was all and women. Briefly, I went to Hollands just so that I could get a degree. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm most people go. Probably the only place that would take me at that point. I think <laughs> women's, women's education can give young women a real sense of strength and power. And for those who choose it, I think it can be outstanding. So, yeah. yes, I I'm, do think there's a place. I do, too. And I just wondered how unpopular an idea that would, that would be. I'm glad you agree with me. I, I couldn't argue with you about it. <laughs> um, but so when you went to Concord, were the politics extremely liberal? I think of Concord as being a sort of staid. In that era, it, was, it wasn't Putney. No. But it also wasn't Miss Porter's. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was, a pretty, it was pretty liberal, and for yeah. me it was an awakening because I had not seen politics of that sort. And um, 
I think I, I evolved quite dramatically in my understanding. Was it your first integrated school? Yes. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. And did you, did you find that making friends with African Americans was an easy thing to do, or did, were there impediments? For me, the most significant aspect of making friends with African Americans was when I went on a summer trip Right. Very small group, Eastern Europe, almost or Eastern somewhere. Europe, and about half the people on the trip were African American. So living with people over time and in awkward situations and so forth mm -hmm. was really a that was a game changer. So how about you? Was Putney your first experience of integration? Uh, no, actually, the high school that I went to, however briefly, um, in Lexington was integrated the year, much the year I went there. Um, and it, it went relatively smoothly, I think. And I made friends with the friends that I have to this day. So I think that, you know, I think that the, while we are close, and particularly relative to the youngsters in the scene, you know, we all probably seem like just old bats up here, but I think those four years that separate us were pretty important, mm -hmm. uh, pretty pivotal. Um, I, do, I do remember my parents outrage at the Prince Edward uh, school closing. I thought it was confined to one county. Am I right? Or That's right. It was Prince Edward that actually you know, did close You all know what we're talking about. So this Harry Bird, her, her next door neighbor, who was evil, evil, evil man. At least he was the devil in my household. He was probably your best friend. I'm he was sorry. He a very good friend of my parents. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sums it up. My parents just detested him, and every dinner conversation was spent there vilifying this Harry Bird guy. He closed down the, he allowed Prince Edward County to close down its schools for six years. Six years. So African Americans got no education. And then he had the audacity to offer um, white people subsidies so that they could ch send their children to boarding school. And one of the big issues in our household was my parents fighting over whether, and I still have journal entries from my mother, fighting over whether or not to take the subsidies. Was it wrong to take the subsidies because they, you know, obviously benefited white people at the expense of African Americans who weren't getting this money for their schools, or should they take it and send their children to Putney where they could be enlightened? And I, honestly, my brother's in the audience, he might remember, I don't know if they took it or not, but I know they sent their children to Putney that much. I know. But it was a really difficult time, and I just remember how fraught and upset, um, uh, how much upset there was. And so when the schools were educated, I just kind of bent over backwards to be nice and gracious to these people who were in the school. Mm -hmm. And also, I felt a kinship with them because I never fit in anywhere. Um, I, was, I wasn't dre dressed right. Your mom at least dressed you right. But <laughs> I wasn't dressed right, and I just, I never felt comfortable. So I thought maybe those were my friends. So we, yeah, so that was an easy transition. So when you got to Putney, did you feel like a Southerner? Did that make you, yeah. was that part of your identity? Yet? Particularly since Johnny Caldwell nicknamed me Reb, and it stuck. <laughs> so everybody in Putney called me Reb. Yeah. So that came with a whole burden. It certainly did. It certainly did. I felt obliged to, um, you know, perform as a rebel. You know, they call you Reb, so God, I guess I am a Reb. But then you owned the South. You know? Yeah. So yeah. You had to own the yeah. South. Fascinating. Yeah, and I went in there with all kinds of, um, unlike you, I think, all kinds of sort of mm, starry-eyed visions of the South. And I had an African-American teacher right off the bat, Jeff Campbell, who just took me under his wing and very, very gently illuminated me. He was so kind. I was obviously an idiot. And he just, you know, he, he knew that he was basically pulling the rug out from I am So something that fascinates me about your gift, Sally, is that you are such a writer and such a person of words. Hold Still is just a magnificent book. And the, 
the comments you make about your work, the things up on the wall upstairs, there's one after another. Of oh, just, that's Sarah. She wrote that. No, when no. they say <laughs> when they say Sally Mann underneath oh. it, I think <laughs> Rob <Okay. you> said <laughs> that. I wish. <laughs> and you did get a degree in creative writing, didn't I did. you? And obviously this was something that interested you. How did you get lured into photography and not just be a writer or I could imagine you just becoming the writer that you obviously are as well. So how do those two things they fit were parallel. together? They were parallel tracks. I wanted to be a poet. I had a boyfriend who was a photographer. We've talked about the dark room. You know how that went. And so they went along together. And then um, I got married at well, just um, 17, 18. And my parents uh, said, OK, good luck. I mean, basically, they, they did like that. They gave me $100 a month for housing and food, and that was and, and they paid my tuition, but that was it, so I had to earn a living. And it was much easier to earn a living with photography, needless to say, than poetry, so I just concentrated on that. and Did the old Malcolm Gladwell 10,000-hour thing. Just got very, very good at it, because I had to, because it was a job. And did your parents support you when you did all that core thing in no. Philadelphia? No. So were you estranged effectively from them at, at your, in your teens, late teens? Well, the important things in my life were not things that I could discuss with them. What did they think you were doing? They worried about it a I lot. Bet. <laughs> they worried about the fact that, oh, here's a story. Um, when I was a freshman at Bryn Mawr College, I had a boyfriend that I met organizing people in a slum in Philadelphia for rat control. So it was a political involvement. This was that core thing? Was that it? Or no, no this, this previous was, to that. Yeah, previous so to that. So many good deeds. And so I Art met this guy travel. and started having this great romance with him. And my mother was terrified that I might be sleeping with this guy. So she drove up, not didn't tell me, drove up, met the freshman dean, and said, I don't think you're exerting enough control over my daughter. And <laughs> the, the freshman dean said, well, we don't do that. And in fact, I'm going to tell your daughter, who we consider an adult, that you were here and discuss your concerns with her. And so I get this call from the freshman dean and hear that my mother had come up, hadn't even called me up or taken me to lunch or dinner and gone back <laughs> yes. to Virginia. And, and that, I think, is an example of how we were just living in different planets. And she had a very rigid version in her mind of what I ought to be, and I was never that, um, increasingly less that. But she died in my junior year of college in 1966. And my father probably had the same attitudes, but not the energy to enforce them. So, no. <laughs> so yeah. that released the pressure. And I kind of went off and did my own thing after that. Right. And can I ask a little bit about um, a time in Philadelphia? Um, and also, this really dovetails on your question for Sally, which was you know, balancing or deciding between writing and photography. Um, some of you may not know, probably most of you, it surprised me that uh, Drew, you also made photographs in college. Hopefully, you put a few Look up. That. That's the one I love. Uh, yeah, and the one on the left, Sally and I just saw it today. Um, we were really struck by them. And so you two had a kind of um, you know, romance with a camera, but I think you're doing something very different. I was just wondering if you'd want to talk a little bit about these pictures. Uh, what you yeah. were doing at this time, I think you were working for HUD maybe then? Do you have the other one of the little girl? One I like yeah. best. Um, these are pictures that I took when I was working for the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1968. It was my first job out of college. And it was a job I took as an uh, expression of my interest in public service and cities and what was happening in cities. And it, I think, grew out of my concerns about race, but it was in an urban northern circumstance. And I took these on a HUD excursion one day, but I was doing quite a bit of photography by that time, in part because of my boyfriend, who was a photographer. Um, <laughs> the boyfriend. <laughs> well? And 
the one who ran around with the view camera later on. But yeah. the, these were taken with a Nikromat 35 millimeter, and we spent a lot of time in the dark room. And you mm -hmm. still have that camera, I trust. I do still have that camera. Yeah. I just unearthed it as we were moving mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Yeah, I'll send so. you some film. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved doing photography at that time, but then, you know, things just, life overtook me, and I didn't continue with it. So it was interesting because I got involved with uh, some people at Temple University in Philadelphia, a group of psychiatrists there, and together with a child psychiatrist, we worked out this idea of having a program where we would give cameras to little kids in areas, distressed areas of Philadelphia, and have them take pictures about their lives and talk about their lives. And we applied for a grant together, and we did not get it. And I sometimes wonder, if we had gotten that grant, where would my life if have gone? If you'd gotten that grant, you'd be Wendy Ewald. <laughs> <laughs> but would I have you know, continued in photography and not gone yeah. to HUD? And, and it just would have been a very different, different pattern. But. Yeah. Well, not too late. <laughs> you do know when, do you know who I'm talking about, Wendy no. Ewald? Do you all know who Andy, Wendy Ewald is? She's, she's amazing. She's a MacArthur fellow, but she, she's also a photographer, and that's exactly what, what she, she does. does. She gives cameras and has done it for 30 years or so. She gives cameras to kids, and they take just the most astonishing. Yeah, look her up. She's. I will. She's really I good. will. Weren't those children who were uh, had been through medical procedures or were damaged in some way? Or I, I think it was homes? just going to be in schools, groups of students, okay. not a particularly okay. I it stressed. Was related to. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about looking at these pictures earlier this week exactly. when you asked if I had any of them. These people are now 60 years old. And yeah. that's kind of jarring to, to think about. It was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah, I was in a checkout line, and this old woman was checking me out. And, and she said, you know, I was one of your 12-year-olds. And I went, whoa! <laughs> you know, life has not been easy to her, but I was just shocked. Yeah, we're getting old. Yep. Time is short. Do you have that feeling, like that? That, that I'm getting old. <laughs> we we know what that feeling is. Your body tells you that, but just that idea that you really have to focus that you, you can't make a wrong decision, whereas before you could make all the wrong decisions in the world. Because you had time to make that. others. Because yeah, you could you could always backtrack and go back and do it right this or do something different. And now you you just have to do it right. There's so little time to do whatever. It is. But I also feel um, two weeks into unemployment. Right. That, You're liberated, <laughs> right? Yeah. That I have freedoms that come with age also to right. try things that maybe I wouldn't have been able to or. Yeah, you're in a, you're in an I feel like an enviable state. position. Yeah. So, so let me ask you something else about your photography that I find so intriguing, which is you have become so technically proficient. You're a chemist and you're a physicist and you... No, no, no. no. You <laughs> make many of these photographs by kinds of technical interventions that seem to me so complex and learned. And did that come to you gradually? Was it something you were really comfortable with from the outset? I have to disabuse you of that premise right there, because I'm really technically not very And I'm not so good with chemistry. And I can't Well, how even, do you do all these miraculous things and know to do these miraculous things? I let Where them happen, and then I act like it was what I wanted in the first place. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I just took a picture the other day, and it was a picture of the screen window at the cabin. I'm trying to document the cabin where so much of my family's life wa was spent. And I got this big scratch down, right down the middle, and I said, oh, shit. And I said, oh, I kind of like that scratch. You know, it really almost looks like it's in the screen. You just, you just learn to accept these serendipitous moments, and they, and they, they can work to your advantage. And just that mindset works to your advantage. I just find the whole mm -hmm. F64 rigid, you know, with zone six, zone five, whatever it is, thing where everyone was so precise, F64, it just wasn't for me. And also, I think it's because, as you pointed out, the southern light 
just doesn't lend itself. You know, the, the kind of pictures I wanted to take and still do take, it just doesn't lend itself to like perfect focus and absolute depth of field and all that kind of thing. So I'm not that good. At it. I am a good printer though. I'll take that. Yeah. And what is involved in your mind in being a good printer? What, what are the Again, characteristics? It's a little, well, you, all, you do have to be pretty careful with measurements and those kind of, nah, nah, not very much. But you have, to, you have to time things a little bit, and you do have to follow the rules about washing and re, refreshing your chemistry and all that kind of stuff, although the print won't work right. Um, but again, I think it's sometimes I'll overexpose something and it'll have some feeling that just seems to work right that I never, if you'd actually done a test strip, you know, you remember test strips, mm -hmm. right? If I'd done a test strip, my test strip would have told me never to try that. So you just have to embrace, embrace these possible failures or failures. I'm going to introduce or interject a little curatorial commentary, which is I don't think you're photographer, <laughs> you don't quite know what you're doing, but that embrace of chance is really important. But one thing that I was thinking about, um, too, which is a kind of parallel between the ways that each of you are doing in your own work, you're kind of doing history differently. And what I mean by that is, um, Drew, when you were writing, um, particularly uh, This Republic of Suffering, you were doing a new kind of history, right? I mean, it was introduced in the 1960s and 70s, but it was looking uh, at different kinds of material, and it was actually really trying to evoke the experience and the materiality of many people that normally were not the subjects of history, were not the great men. And so you use, you sort of put yourself back into the shoes of those who had you know, walked and lived and died during the Civil War, witnessed death, buried, and so it is that lived experience and that kind of texture of daily life. And I, I and this is something we've never actually talked about, but I think about the fact that you, know, you started taking up collodion. I mean, you saw you know, the picture that you loved by France. Was it France's picture? France Yeah, that was one of them. But don't forget all those Miley's before and that. And the Miley, right. And so the other thing, though, is in the fact, that's great. I probably have one somewhere 20 slides down. Um, you had this experience cleaning these negatives by Michael Miley. There we go. Oh, yeah, there you go. And you know you were struck by that continuity of past and present, but you didn't just want to make pictures that looked old or that somehow conveyed history. You actually used the same techniques, right? You you got your hands dirty. So in a way, you're embedding yourself in the same kind of sense of the materiality of that process that 19th century photographers did you took that on. And so in a way, it's kind of doing it's the same experience that Gardner or Brady or others had in the Civil War. So I sort of see that as a... As you know, a I, I thought about that when I was writing the section of my essay for the catalog about how you looked at Civil War battlefields, which was through the same lens as those who'd been there. And mm -hmm. if I wanted to describe how I want to write history, it would be to look at the world through the lens Mm -hmm. of those who experienced it. What was it like for them from their perspective, not mm -hmm. how do we analyze it going backwards. Almost so, a literal lens. Yes, exactly, literal lens, and in my case, the eye lens, yeah. in, a, in a way. So seeing through the eyes of the time itself, and you do that in a very literal sense by using these old lenses. Right, and, and prior to when you started looking at <laughs> Civil War history and writing, I guess it was the Republic of Suffering, History had been looked at much differently. It was always told from the advantage of the of the victors and of the generals and of the you know of the of the literate classes. And and in the 80s, I guess it started being told more from the the people, the people who you know 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I'm off a couple of couple of what's a couple of decades. Yeah. No, no. But it's been a huge shift mm -hmm. in Civil yeah. War history. Huge shift. And yeah. It was, that there was a, somebody that even referred to him as the inarticulates. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is such an interesting term. It reminds me of Richard Avedon talking about the innocence of his picture. Um, that's, that's a fascinating uh, parallel, I think, to yeah. think about the innocence of, of pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but 
So when you say that you wanted to look at it from the lens and through the eyes of the people that were there, that's exactly, I mean, I would, I would put the camera down on the ground mm -hmm. and imagine, imagine the, light, the last vision that some poor dying soldier saw. And, and meanwhile, you were looking, you, you, I assume, were looking through. Well, the, there's a letter that I quote and that the film that was made by PBS of my book begins with from a man named James Montgomery writing to his parents saying, you will be delighted to hear from your dying son. And he's describing his death and the letter is covered with, splattered with his blood. And so that's, oh, you know, he is telling his parents what it's like for him to die. And that's, in a sense, putting the camera yeah. on the ground next yeah. to him. Yeah, how did you find that letter? It's in, it was in the Museum of the Confederacy. It was collected there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Yeah, I would say. So do you, do you think that there is a Southern fascination with death? I mean, that mm -hmm. both of you share? Uh, or well, Sally, you said your father was fascinated with death. Uh, yeah. But that, that was a, that was a um, he was interested in the iconography of, of death. He was interested in how death was portrayed in art. Because um, he had such a fascination for art, but I do think Southerners are kind of on a first name basis with death more than more than other parts of the country. I mean, we're just steeped in it. There's there's just so many more. There were so many more Civil War deaths on that part of the land. What was it that you say in your book? It's something like sixty million pounds of flesh at Gettysburg. At, that's just Gettysburg. I thought, oh, jeez, 60 million pounds of flesh. Sick. But what, um, was what led million? me to think about death was looking at that world through the eyes of the people mm -hmm. who were living it and listening to them in their letters. And it was something that people, historians in the 20th century, hadn't really thought about because, of course, everyone who lived in the Civil War era is dead now. Yeah. But yeah. for the people who lived through it, that was the essence most significant aspect of their lives, losing people, worrying about yeah. losing people, dealing with having lost loved ones, right. and fearing it. And so it's, again, putting the camera on the ground and seeing what it looks like from the perspective of those. Yeah, and I was approaching it from a, 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 the, the angle of the landscape. I was mm -hmm. just trying to imagine what, what was under that soil, what, you know, how the ground was like sculpted mm -hmm. by the bodies mm -hmm. of, all the, of all the dead. And I think for both of us, we talked about this a little bit today when we were walking through the exhibit, the death-haunted nature and the violent nature of the experience of that landscape during the war was preceded by the violence of, of the slavery. system of slavery mm -hmm. that had inhabited that landscape and caused the war. That it left a terrible stain yeah, on it. It was yeah, a system. Indelible stain. The whole social system was based on violence and the threat of, of death. Yeah. But this was carnage of such industrial proportions yep. Yep. That, that, I mean, it completely radically changed everybody's thinking. You, you can't look at the landscape without the, or I can't. I'm like, there's a great line from Flaubert where he says that he can't look at a cradle without thinking of a grave, and he can't mm -hmm. look at a beautiful woman without thinking of her skeleton. I mean, I was, I was so involved in this project that I couldn't look at the landscape without thinking of the remains sort of shifting under, mm -hmm. under the ground. But Sally, yeah. when you were growing up, you didn't have, you didn't sort of visit Civil War battlefields in the way that you did. I mean, Drew, this sounds like it was a sort of a family pastime, right? You played all the time, and it took you a long time. Like yeah, you destiny were, or something. Yes, yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about that experience, because there was a moment, too, when you, you realized that the way that you and your brothers had been enacting the Civil War, it, 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 you know, in fact, um, the, the victors <laughs> had been switched, right? <laughs> this is, uh, my older brother always made me be Grant. Yeah. <laughs> and That's it wasn't good. until I reached quite an advanced age that I realized I'd actually won. <laughs> <laughs> That's brothers for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we would go on 
family excursions to see battlefields, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Manassas, and also the we were kind of revving up to the Civil War centennial, so there was a lot of noise in the community about who was gonna participate, and my older brother thought it would be great if he could you know, ride in the cavalry in some reenactment, and we would go to, <clears throat> I remember going to the reenactment in September of 1962 of Antietam. Yeah. And this was at a moment when civil rights issues were just exploding 50 miles away in the national capital and... 62? 62. Yeah. And here is this kind of reactionary reenactment of the Battle of Antietam with no acknowledgement of the place of Antietam in our history or the fact that it led to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation or you know any of the larger context. Did it was you think like that at the time? Did I think about... Uh, no, okay, I wasn't just when I was there. Yeah, okay. No. <laughs> I didn't know enough to, to think that way. Did you have to play Grant in the reenactment? No, by then I figured out that Grant won. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things, too, I wanted to touch on, um, Sally, you write so movingly in your memoir about um, Virginia Carter, GG. Let's find some pictures of her. There you go. There she is um, at your wedding and older. And uh, Carter was the um, African-American woman who raised you and worked for your family for 50 years. And um, you made a series of beautiful photographs of her as well as part of the Immediate Family series. And I think it's very interesting that she is part of Immediate Family. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So she's part of your family, but in writing Hold Still and in looking back at your um, childhood, you sort of overtaken with a sense of um, shame for not really having interrogated that domestic internal segregation, even within a liberal household, you know, not next door mm -hmm. to Harry Bird. Uh, but Drew Foss, you've also spoken too about the fact that your family had uh, two people working and living with you, two African Americans, and the confusion you felt as a child over, you know, the unequal treatment. I'm just love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Did they live with you? They didn't sleep in the house. They lived in the town oh, nearby. Okay. okay. But they came in every day. How yeah. did they get there? Um, well, one was a man named, it spelled Raphael like the painter, but yeah. pronounced Rayfield. And Rayfield would pick up Victoria and bring Victoria. So he had a car? He had a car. It was provided by my father. Oh. And then he would drive us to school and do all manner of this and that around the house, pick us up from school, take us to the dentist, what, you know, whatever was necessary. And he was always wonderful with us. He'd quiz us on state capitals on the way to school. And, you was know, he we, educated at all? Not in a, I mean, I, I doubt he'd gotten beyond eighth grade. Yeah, I doubt it too. Because um, you know, at eighth grade, they, you had to go to a private school if you were African American. And he, um, he was just always such, he was really fun. You know, we really enjoyed being around him, and he teased us, and he played with us. And What we, age was he? He was probably, when I was growing up, he was probably 35 to 45, I would guess. He died Did he have a about, family? He had a daughter who was seriously disabled. I'm not sure in what, exactly what, something like Parkinson's of some sort or, or some kind of... Cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy, maybe. And Victoria was the most spectacular cook. We were not allowed in the kitchen. <clears throat> this was her domain. She didn't want us interrupting it. But they were very much a part of our lives. But I didn't... I knew there were distances. I knew there were things that I wasn't supposed to talk to them about. I remember actually asking Rayfield when I had this revelation about the schools being segregated on purpose. I started asking him questions about it, and it was clear he did not want to talk to me about it. And I realized that this was rude somehow, that I shouldn't be pressing him on this, that it was not polite to... 
See, and try to make him answer. And so I think it made him uncomfortable. Exactly. Exactly. And so the regime of racial etiquette that we were taught as children came as part of general manners, mm -hmm. yeah. I think. And I, I think it's fascinating to think about how you learn segregation, how you learn to act in a society like that. I, I remember, and I've, I've written about this actually, there was a bathroom just off the kitchen that was for Raphael and Victoria, and we were told not to use that bathroom. So we had a segregated bathroom in my house when I was growing up. But I was told, I was, it was always annoying. Maybe I was nearer that bathroom than any other bathroom, and my mother was always very sharp with me if I made a move towards using that bathroom or she'd heard I'd use that bathroom. But she'd say, it's their bathroom. You need to give them their privacy. Do not intrude on that bathroom. And of course, that wasn't really the reason. It was a right. segregated bathroom. Yeah, but I mean, there's a grain of, it makes a little tiny bit of sense. I mean, it is the one place they could go, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And, I don't know, have a moment by themselves. I know the, the lack of privacy. That's Drew, I asked you earlier, I had been curious about this timing of the letter you wrote as a nine year old to President Eisenhower, because it was just four or five months after the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, over Emmett Till's murderers. And interestingly, in the way that history is continually folding back on itself, this case has just been reopened by the Justice Department. But you told me, you know, you didn't know about it for many years. Um, and I don't think I did. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I tried to reconstruct when I found when, the letter yeah. in the National Archives what might I have been hearing Here. at that time yeah. exactly that sent me off. You don't know what you to write that letter? That's a pretty radical thing. Perhaps it was not, though, I mean, the Emmett Till murder was not the kind of thing your parents would have talked about, and certainly not they with have. you, a nine-year-old you know, girl. It maybe didn't even make it into the paper. Papers. It made it into Jet and right. Ebony. So the, Those were the news rude. was segregated. Yeah, the mm -hmm. news was segregated. And think about back then, it was really hard to get news. There's no internet, there's no, I mean, how, did, how would we have known? I know that I saw one of my, and again, it's so time is, is so mutable and it's labile and I'm not really sure when, but I saw, um, I'm pretty sure I saw a picture of Emmett Till in his casket at some point. Do you, do you and, and I remember. I don't remember that, that. and I, when I think about where I got news, we didn't have a television. Right, neither We did didn't we. get a daily newspaper. Oh, you didn't? Mm-mm. But. I used to, Raphael used to play the radio all the time when he was driving us around. And so I wonder what we might have heard listening to the radio with Raphael. Can I ask why you didn't get a newspaper? Do you have any idea why that is? Um, you lived in, near Washington. Right. My mother subscribed to the Herald Tribune, which came two days late. Uh -huh. So there was that. <laughs> yeah. But there was no like regular newspaper. My New York Times comes two days late. <laughs> so don't make fun of us down there. I won't. I won't. I won't. But it didn't exactly give us timely views. I mean, I don't remember people sitting around reading newspapers and discussing the news. Life magazine? We got Life, Look, things like that. Yeah. So that, yep, that might yeah, have been I a source. I think that's where, I, I remember seeing two things. I'm, Pretty sure, but then, you know, your trickster memory, but I'm pretty sure I remember seeing Emmett Till picture and I remember seeing a lynched man tied to, chained mm. to a tree and it just burned an indelible image into my mind. And it, but who knows when that was? Yeah. How we know what we know. It's yeah. So interesting. Yeah, and how shocking how we contort ourselves to accommodate what we think we remember. I mean, my brother Bob will probably stand up right now and point out um, things in my book that I'm remembering that is actually what he remembers, and he thinks it's his story, my, not my story. And, you know, neither one of us can really be sure who did experience mm -hmm. that thing. Mm -hmm. well, part of going to New England was a very different exposure to sources of information. I think that there was a lot of newspapers and conversation yeah. and activity and so forth that I was suddenly made aware of when, when I left the South. And did you have uh, speakers come who were, yes. because at Putney we had all these, yes. you know, agitators. Yeah. Norman Thomas came, I mean, uh, just yeah. think. And, yeah, socialist yeah. candidate, right? Yeah. And I, 
he was, he was yeah. um, went to see Martin Luther King speak. I mean, it was just a ah. different world. So one of the things that um, happened while we were putting together this exhibition, in fact, while we were piecing together the catalog, and I think you were probably putting the finishing touches on your essay, Drew, was um, protests erupting over the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee in a public park in Charlottesville and the white nationalist um, uh, marches and the death of Heather Hare. And it really, I think, hit all of us, um, struck us in a very profound and, and challenging way that um, this history, that the Civil War, um, the pictures in the battlefields, this is not just history, or you know, the Faulkner quote, the past is not dead, it's not even past. But I was wondering, you were describing this moment for you in the, in the 60s, where on the one hand there's this, um, you know, the centennial of the Civil War and this kind of reconstruction. On the other hand, there's, there's civil rights protests, this kind of agitation and this dissonance in culture. And are we there again now, or have we never left? And what is the work of a historian or an artist or just the citizen? How, have we not really come to terms with our past or with the South? Are we still kind of having to reinterrogate the same things over and over again? I'd say that if you look at our work, very different fields, history and photography, we both have been acting throughout our lives as if the work was not done. That horrifying as Charlottesville was, in some sense, the fact that you continued to do the work you did, the fact that I continued with some interruptions to write the kind of work I have, is just a testament to the fact that we think there's more to be it's done. It's not done. Yeah. Would, you, would you say that? Too? Yeah, absolutely. Charlottesville was such an eye-opener. You know, we're having a little uh, kerfuffle, and um, maybe that's uh, sort of understating what, what, what's happened in Lexington, but um, when, when the, our little humble red hen restaurant uh, oh, wow. refused to serve Sarah Sanders, it turned into a white nationalist, um, you know, shout fest. And yeah, the, the Ku Klux Klan came and blanketed the town with leaflets, and. I mean, we were just standing there in a gastitude saying, what is this, our little town, how can this be? And then we look all around and there's, you know, Robert E. Lee everywhere, Washington and Lee University, Stonewall Jackson House. I mean, how, how is that all that going to be solved with, without bloodshed, without more Heather Haynes, Hines? Um, that it was just sheer luck that it was just one person in Charlottesville. And how, how in the world, I mean, there's certainly nothing that Drew and I can do, but how, how, can, the, how can the people at large solve this? As, you know, and now, and my pictures are so provocative, which at the time I took them, I thought the world needed a little shaking up. Now I'm thinking, whoa, I'm backing off these pictures because, you know, I'm not sure the world can take it right now. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, as, as you know, yeah. So Sally, what comes next? Those are the five, other than someone saying, have you been working lately? <laughs> Those are my five least favorite I'm words. Sorry. I bet they're yours too. <laughs> so what comes next, Drew? What are you going to do now? <laughs> But you just said something so interesting, which is you wonder if this is a moment in which... You have to being, back off. Yeah, if it's being yeah. provocative, too dangerous or too destructive. It actually does feel dangerous, because I know the, the um, woman who runs the Red Hen, and she, was, she had many, many, many death threats. Um, she's, now, she's now being protected by um, the Secret Service. That's scary. All she, I mean, she wasn't even taking that big a political stand. She was backing up her wait staff who didn't want to serve you know, someone who was in, implementing policies that they were so deeply opposed to. I, yeah, I'm, a little, I'm, I, I'm actually a little scared. 
Are you? I'm not personally scared, but scared for... Well, I'm scared for our country. Our country. I am scared I, I for our country. We've... But I feel that we have got to address this issue of race that has been at the heart of so much of what has torn us apart. And I feel that I have a special relationship to that question because of the way I grew up and where I grew up, the time I grew up, the work I've done as a historian. And I guess part of my job, now that I don't have another job, is to figure out what contribution I might make, make in that arena and yeah. what kind of writing or action or engagement would build on the many years in which that has mattered to me in a way that could be constructive. You've and I don't know the answer to that. So if you ask me what comes next, I'd say, I, I don't know, but this is what I think is important to figure out. Yeah. Do you feel, I mean, you marched in, in Selma. Did you, it was the march that went across the Pettus Bridge. Was it that was, march or was the, it? there was a march where John Lewis got his head bashed in. Right. And then Martin Luther King said, we're going to have another march. Okay, Everybody I there come. Were two. So I came, to, then I listened to the call and went to the one, the second one. The second one. So were you afraid? I was terrified. Yeah. But I was also 17 years old, so I sort of thought I was invincible. Yeah. But you don't feel, in, do, you, do you feel a similar, you know, more existential terror at this, or fear at this point? Do you, do you feel that it's a bigger fear, a greater arena than, because back then, until, until it moved up to the northern cities and it became mm -hmm. about social justice and and the cities were on fire. It was really isolated in the South. And the fear was a sort of very particular, almost a bodily fear. Now, the fear that I have is just this, I feel that, I feel the Republic is threatened. Mm -hmm. I truly do. I feel that the kind of polarization and permission to hate that is abroad at the moment in our land is really terrifying. And for the last two years, well, really the whole time I was president at Harvard, but as this permission to hate has been expressed so much more openly nationwide, trying to keep the Harvard campus a community in which people of such enormous and diverse, uh, enormously different and diverse origins, trying to make that the noble experiment that we want it to be has been a real really a major part of my work over the last several years. And so far we've done okay, but that's a very special world. I was gonna say. And yeah. um, I think that work is very important because people will leave that world knowing that there can be such a world and I think feeling invested mm -hmm. in making the rest of the world more like that. But how can we bring the entire society to recognize that hatred and, and, and prejudice and marginalization of others and denigration of others and violence against others is not the foundation for the world we want to we want to be in. I wonder one of the things that points that your book made was that the Republic was actually the vinculum the, the glue that pulled the Republic together was blood. Truly was it was the, it was the deaths of all those people that actually created our republic and held it held it together. And now it makes you wonder, you know, the way I see it with the republic being threatened, whether or not it's going to take that kind of. I mean, God help us, but it's just I I feel I just feel it so dire, and maybe it's because I've been I'm so affected by what has happened in Lexington and the and seeing the white nationalists and the. Mm -hmm. Screaming hatred. My, my closest friends are, are, are gay, and th they're in tears, tears because of the, because a lot of it was, you know, because they're of the They're terrified, staff. right? Yeah, they're terrified. They're, they're from Alabama, and they've always been terrified. Um, but now they're, they're, they're newly re-terrified. I, I don't know. I just have a very bleak outlook. Mm -hmm. um, so get to work. 
Yeah. Figure it out, right? Yeah. Come do on, you're something. One of, you're one of the great minds. You have nothing to do. You've had two weeks but, off. <laughs> right. Um, I really don't like to close the evening on, on such a such, I'm such a downer, yeah. Sally. I'm sorry. But actually, I think it's really an important point, which is that we are at a crisis point in our culture in terms of what I would say our civic culture. The idea that we have a civil discourse, this thing that, bind, that has bound us together as a nation despite all of our differences, is kind of this belief that it's possible, right? That it's, even if it's not actual most of the time, that it's possible that um, we share something, some ideal of nationhood, um, of democracy. And, and when the belief that that's no longer possible, you know, when, when that, that to me is as distressing as the actuality, because I, I really do think that it is, in some ways we have to believe that it is possible to have conversations so, across difference. So uh, this may be a hopelessly romantic intervention and in response to what you just said, and one that comes from someone who is not an artist, but we are in a museum. We have had the privilege today of looking at your extraordinary work and the power that it has to not just provoke, but enlighten and bring together and unite us in our common humanity. And it's so hard for Americans to talk rationally to one another at this moment, but we must try. But also, does that leave a special role for the arts and a special role for what art can do to address things that we're unable at this moment to speak in rational and to build some foundations of commonality and some kinds of communities, like the one that's here. Look at this. It, it brings people together with yeah, shared I aspirations. Bet you, I bet you 90%, 99% of these people didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Just a hunch. <laughs> So where are the people who did vote for Trump? And how do, you, how do you bring them physically together without fisticuffs? And how do you bring them, I mean, I, I'm a, I agree with you. I think art is, could play a really important mm -hmm. role in this. And that's, uh, we, that, we were not unmindful of that, of that possibility for this show. I think, of course, it terrified us, to be honest. But. I think it's our, I think it's, um, it's all of those endeavors which speak to our common humanity and really any opportunity that we have to bring people together. Trump voters, welcome, in fact. <laughs> um, yeah, it is the idea that there are still spaces for civil, civil and civic discourse. And I do think the arts play a special role because creativity is universal. And so much of what you're doing in your work is about a kind of universality of human experience, of love, of pain, of suffering, of beauty. And so many people experience those things. And you know, if we can pull away the layers of particular identity and politics and get to some of those core commonalities, maybe we can avoid a second civil war. Just one quick thing, well, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but the access to art is so important. I mean, it, the National Gallery was great because it's our National Gallery, and anyone can go there, and all kinds of people did. People from my town who've never been to a museum went, and it, it was exciting t to me. But short of pulling a a museum 18-wheeler into a Walmart parking lot, which I'm not joking is a really good idea. I don't know how we're going to get these people to enjoy art and use art, how, how we're going to get art to get to the people, how the people are going to find it. Seriously, we're, we're very, this is an elitist and very rarefied gathering and, and place. And I just, I wonder that, that, our, that our gap is just so great now that, and just even the idea of art just seems so elitist and, you know, untrumpian. <laughs> I don't know. I love the idea of the 18-wheeler um, museum, though. Eric, I'll shut up in a minute. But Eric Fischel tried that. Do you know about that? 
he, he was putting together a, a group of artists. He picked, I don't know, a hundred of us. And he did some America here and now, and it was supposed to address the issues of America through art. And he, he had a series of 18 wheelers, and he, took, and he was going to take them to the Walmart parking lot, and of course he ran out of money. <laughs> but, yeah, how do we get, how do we, how do we let our art work for us? Well, I think that's a great challenge for museums. All museums, actually, are, are really grappling with these questions of accessibility and inclusion, not just in the physical space and bringing art outside the walls, but also in the programming we do, in the language we use, um, and in the opportunities we provide for people to engage with works of art. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge as um, audience goers change and expectations change, as um, questions of technology change, but I think it is really the challenge for museums in the 21st century is not building great collections, um, of course, or doing blockbuster shows, but it is really making the museum permeable to the community and making it a point of accessibility and interchange, but also a space for conversation. And I think on that note, I <laughs> would like cheerful. to thank. Good job. Winding it up. I would like up. to thank Sally and yeah. Drew. Thank you.